This is Ancient Faith Radio, timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and then all holy and good, and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, to Search the Scriptures Live. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantinou, and this is episode 203 of Search the Scriptures Live. Today's date is April 24th, Ronya Pala. Happy name day to everybody who celebrated yesterday, yesterday, the feast day of St. George, one of the great saints, one of the most popular saints in the Orthodox tradition. So it's been a few weeks since we had our program. We missed two Mondays because, of course, of Holy Week and then Bright Week last week. I kind of wanted to do the program, but I was pretty exhausted, as I'm sure all of you were, too, after Holy Week. But here we are back again to continue our study of the Gospel of St. Matthew. But coming up soon, in about 10 days or so, on May 5th and 6th, I will be in Columbus, Mississippi, at St. Catherine Orthodox Church. It's a beautiful little mission parish, and we're going to be discussing the resurrection, um, excuse me, not the resurrection, the revelation of St. John uh, on Friday night, and then all day Saturday there's a retreat um, on Thinking Orthodox, on the Orthodox Fronima. That's St. Catherine Church in Columbus, Mississippi. So if you're interested in joining us for that, that would be great. It's always nice to be back in the South with the wonderful people down there. So um, for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the Lord's Prayer. I've never done a very in-depth study of the Lord's Prayer, but we're going to devote ourselves to that because that's where we are in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in chapter 6 where the Lord gives us his prayer. And we're going to be using almost exclusively insights from the fathers of the church. And, you know, we're so familiar with the Lord's Prayer. It seems like, well, how much is there to say about it, really? And it kind of reminds me in some ways about the crucifixion of Christ. The reason why I wrote the book, you know, the crucifixion of the King of Glory, is because we feel like we know it so well, because we know the stories, we're so familiar with them, but there is so much depth to everything in that. So even though you might think, well, gee, you know, the Lord's Prayer, how interesting can that be? I hope you will stay with us for the course of this study, uh, because it is such an important prayer. And I think there's a lot a lot of spiritual meaning and message and inspiration that we can draw out of it. All Christians say this prayer, and that's perhaps one of the, one of the, I think one of the features of of the Christian faith that unites us because we are so different in so many ways, but all of us know this prayer and all of us pray this prayer. Even Christians who don't believe in memorized prayers because the Lord gave this prayer They actually know it and they practice it. So we're going to go through it line by line to uncover its deep 
spiritual meaning. And uh, we're going to use for our study the fathers of the church who um, gave us sort of line-by-line commentaries on this prayer. Some of them are more extensive, others less so. But we have quite a few, not surprisingly, because of the importance of this prayer. You know, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Gregory of Nyssa, Cyril of Jerusalem, Cyril of Alexandria, Maximus the Confessor, and St. John Chrysostom, to mention a few. But before we even begin to talk about the, the Lord's Prayer specifically, I wanted to read to you about the importance of prayer for in the treatise on the Lord's Prayer by St. Gregory of Nyssa. And uh, he is the younger brother of St. Basil the Great. Now, he is, of course, one of the Cappadocian fathers, one of those great fathers from the 4th century. Um, he, in many ways, was very important because St. Basil died rather young uh, in the year um, 379, and there was a lot of work unfinished that St. Gregory of Nyssa, his younger brother, completed, and also he picked up the pen to write against many of the heresies that were affecting the church at that time. But um, he never quite got the recognition that St. Saint Basil did. So if I'm, I'm a middle child, so maybe you have figured that out by, your, by the personality <laughs> that I have. I'm a middle child. Any of you younger siblings who always felt that you didn't quite get the respect that your older siblings did, maybe you could identify with St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, in recent years, of course, he's been you know, recognized and, and there's been more attention paid to him and his works. He's known as a particularly mystical writer. He's very famous for his writings um, on, for example, the life of Moses uh, from a mystical perspective and also from a historical perspective. But I think that uh, we don't see as many as many um, churches named for St. Gregory of Nyssa. There is one here in the in the San Diego, greater San Diego area. And I know there's one on Long Island, in the South Shore of Long Island, St. Gregory of Nyssa, but not as many as there are for, for St. Gregory the theologian. So I think he doesn't quite always get the respect that he deserves. But let us begin by reading from St. Gregory of Nyssa, because I found his comments to be very useful on prayer, and I wanted to share them with you because now we are in this post-Paschal period. It's only been about eight days since Great and Holy Pascha, and I don't know about you, but I've already noticed that I'm not praying the way I should. We were really into our prayers during Lent, and of course on Holy Week we were in church for so many hours, and now that the resurrection has happened, it's easy for us to slip back into our old patterns in spite of the fact that the Lord has risen. So as I was reading St. Gregory of Nyssa's words, I found them very inspiring and a good reminder about the importance of persevering in prayer. So that's why I wanted to begin our lesson today, not just jumping straight into the prayer itself, but by talking to you about the importance of prayer, because that's how St. Gregory begins. He's trying to remind us about why prayer is so important and how we disregard it. And he also talks to us about exactly what prayer is. So here is St. Gregory of Nyssa, his treatise on the Lord's Prayer from Sermon 1. I think it right, first of all, to insist as much as possible that one must persevere in prayer. For I see that in this present life, men give their attention to everything else one concentrating on this matter, another on that, but no one devotes his zeal to the good work of prayer. The tradesman rises early to attend to his shop, anxious to display his wares sooner than his competitor, so as to get in before them, to be the first to attend to the customer and sell his stock. The customer does the same, and he takes good care not to miss what he wants by letting someone else anticipate him. And so he hastens not to church, but to the market. Thus, all are equally keen on gain and anxious to be on the spot before their neighbors 
and the hour of prayer is usurped by those things that hold their interest and is turned into time for trafficking. He means commerce, right? It is the same with the craftsman, with the orator, with the man who brings a lawsuit, as well as with the judge. Everyone devotes all his energy to the work he has in hand, forgetting completely the work of prayer, because he thinks that the time he gives to God is lost to the work he has prepared or purpose to do. For the craftsman considers that the divine assistance is quite useless for the work he has in hand. Therefore, he leaves prayer aside and places all his hopes in his hands. Without remembering him who has given him his hands, it is the same with the other occupations. The fact that that the mind centers its attention on material, earthly things, prevents the soul from devoting itself to the better, heavenly things. Thus it comes about that life is so full of sin, which is always increasing in growth and involved in all human pursuits. Therefore, everyone keeps forgetting God, and men do not count prayer among the good things worth pursuing. How could anyone describe in detail all the different ways in which sin is mixed up in human life? And the reason for this is none other than that men will not ask the help of God for the things they have in hand. If work is preceded by prayer, sin will find no entrance into the soul for when the consciousness of God is firmly established in the heart, the devices of the devil, devil remain sterile. Whatever anyone may set out to do, if it is done with prayer, the undertaking will prosper and he will be kept from sin because there is nothing to oppose him and drag the soul into passion. If, on the other hand, a man leaves God out and gives his attention to nothing but his business, then he inevitably opposes God because he is separated from him. For a person who does not unite himself to God through prayer is separated from God. For the effects of prayer are union with God, and if someone is with God, he is separated from the enemy. Through prayer, we guard our chastity, control our temper, and rid ourselves of vanity. It makes us forget injuries, overcome envy, defeats injustice, and makes amends for sin. Through prayer, we obtain physical well-being, a happy home, a strong, well-ordered society. Prayer will make our nation powerful and will give us victory in war and security in peace. Prayer is the seal of virginity and a pledge of faithfulness in marriage. Prayer is intimacy with God and contemplation of the invisible. It satisfies our yearnings and makes us equal to the angels. So that's St. Gregory of Nyssa on the importance of prayer. Didn't you find that inspiring? I certainly did because I know that it's so easy to think we have too much to do. We're so busy running back and forth trying to take care of all of our different responsibilities. We tend to say, well, did I do my rule of prayer? We're lucky if we even do that. But sometimes when we treat our rule of prayer, and for those of you who don't know, the rule of prayer is there are the daily prayers that you are have decided to do as an Orthodox Christian or Christian, or you have been sort of assigned to do or asked to do by your spiritual father. We call that our rule of prayer. That is the set of prayers that we do and the routine that we have for prayers. So because we have a rule of prayer, and usually it's it's fairly short for those of us who are in the world. Monastics have a much longer rule of prayer. They have a lot of prayers 
that they have to say in the course of the day and the night. But because we have this rule of prayer, it's easy to think that if we have done our rule, then we have fulfilled our kind of obligation for prayer. And this is such a big mistake because it's very, very important for us to uh, not treat it as though it were an obligation, but to give that brief period of time our full attention. And when we start to treat it like a rule in the sense as something that has to be done, but we can be thinking about other things or what we need to do next, and not simply be standing before God with our whole attention, this does not profit us at all. Our prayer does not profit us, and we are treating it in the wrong way completely. So uh, here is St. Gregory of Nyssa, who's going to start talking about how we should pray, and he says it's not with vain babbling. Now remember, the Lord spoke about this, earlier in chapter 6, that when we pray, we should go into a a closet, a small room, in other words, a secret place, so as not to be seen by people and not to engage in vain babbling. Well, St. Gregory of Nyssa has a very strong opinion about what that means. And he doesn't think it's just mere repetition of words, but rather praying for worldly things. And this is quite unacceptable because God, who is spiritual and heavenly, doesn't want us to just be praying about worldly matters, especially things that are um, are completely inappropriate. In other words, praying for the downfall of somebody who is our enemy, for example. Okay, So here is uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa in his treatise on the Lord's Prayer. This is still from Sermon 1. Now, I think that Even if we spend our whole life in constant communion with God in prayer and thanksgiving, we should be as far from having made him an adequate return as if we had not even begun to desire making the giver of all good things such a return. It's clear that in order to obtain our desires, we must learn how we ought to pray. What then are we taught about it? When you are praying, quote, do not babble as the heathens do, for they think that in their much speaking they may be heard. Of course, that's a quotation from Matthew earlier in the chapter, from what the Lord instructed earlier in the chapter 6 of, of Matthew's gospel. Perhaps the meaning is quite clear in itself. It is cast in rather simple language. At the time of prayer... We should not allow such things to enter as passion puts into the minds of people. Childish people imagine that they are worth wonderful things happening in themselves. They daydream about riches and marriages and kingdoms and big cities that are called by their name, and they imagine that they actually are in such a position as their silly ideas suggest. In the same way, if a person during prayer is not intent on what profits his soul, but would rather that God should fall in with the emotional uncertainties of his own mind, he is truly like a silly babbler who prays that God should become a willing servant of his own crazy ideas. Did you ever think about that? So, you know, the Lord also said, your heavenly father knows what you need. Don't pray for those things. Now, sometimes we are encouraged to pray for those things because St. John Chrysostom says, this reminds us of our need for God. But if our prayer is wholly preoccupied, preoccupied with our desire for worldly things, this is like vain babbling. This is what St. Gregory of Nyssa says. And he gives an example. Suppose someone approaches God in prayer, but failing to appreciate the exalted greatness whom he is addressing, unwittingly insulted his majesty with nothing but base, he means lowly, petitions. It is just as if a very poor and uneducated man who thought earthenware precious approached a king who decided to distribute riches. 
In the same way, the man who makes prayer without being properly taught will not lift himself up to the height of the giver, but wants the divine power to descend to the mean earthly level of his own desires. Have you, have you ever thought about that? That's quite a wonderful insight. The idea that when we're only praying for, you know, what we feel like we need in this life or, you know, for a job uh, promotion or, you know, family member or to get married or, or have more money or whatever it is, we're really trying to bring God down to our low level, to a human level, rather than trying to elevate ourselves spiritually. So St. Gregory continues, it would be a very silly thing indeed to approach God in order to seek temporal things from the eternal, earthly goods from heavenly goodness. For this means to seek low things from the highest, some contemptible contemptible temporal good fortune from him who bestows the kingdom of heaven to seek from him who gives those things that cannot be taken away the temporary use of some inessential trifles which will certainly be taken away which are enjoyed only for a little time and the use of which is fraught with danger well does he show the absurdity of such requests by adding as the heathen. You don't babble the way the heathen do. For to be eagerly interested in the things of sense is characteristic of those who have neither hope in the world to come nor fear of judgment and the threat of hell, since they do not expect any of the good things for which we hope in the resurrection, they are like cattle, concerned only with this present life, how to indulge their palate and their stomachs and the desire for the luxuries of the body. That's the pagans, of course, because they don't believe in the resurrection. But if anyone speaks to them of the hope to come, he seems to them a perfect fool, raving about paradise and the life in the kingdom of heaven, and so on. Since then, attachment to the present life is the characteristic of those who are without hope. Scripture rightly says that the quite superfluous desires which people addicted to pleasure fancy to get fulfilled by prayer belong to the heathens, for they suppose that if they persist in asking for these absurdities, the divinity will help to them to get them, however unfitting they may be. So that's St. Gregory of Nyssa giving us his introduction to the Lord's Prayer. So now let's start talking about the Lord's Prayer itself. It has been a very important part of Christian life since the beginning. You know, outside of the New, the New Testament itself, the oldest Christian document is called the Didache. That's what they call it in English. In Greek, we would say the Dahi, Don Apostolon, the Didache, or the, meaning the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. And this is a very ancient Christian document. Parts of it go, go back to the middle of the first century. If you've never read it, you should. And in the Didache, it mentions the Lord's Prayer and that Christians were accustomed to praying it three times a day. The early Christians all prayed this prayer three times a day. And of course, we know that it's an important part of the divine liturgy, and many Christians pray it before their meals, especially at, at lunchtime. So the, the Lord's Prayer is found in the Gospel of Matthew in the form in which we recite it, and by the way, if you ever wondered why we say uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that sort of thing, that translation in English comes from the King James Version of the Bible. That was the version that was authorized by King James I of England when he commissioned the translation of the, of the Bible in sort of a neutral manner, because there were English translations 
that were done by Protestants that were very skewed toward Protestant ideas. And then there was an English translation that was done by the Catholics that was sort of skewed against the Protestants and toward Catholic ideas. And Europe, including England, was torn apart by these battles between Catholics and Protestants. So what King James, who had been James of Scotland, when he became James of England, King James I of England, he was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. When he became the king of both, not only Scotland, but also England, the United Kingdom, he, and united those kingdoms, he uh, commissioned this translation of the Bible using the best translators from among both Protestants and Catholics. And this was done and co- actually completed in the year 1611. So, so a few years ago, we celebrated the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Now, this is the Bible with the these and the thous. And that's why when we recite this prayer, we say it like that, you know, for thine is the kingdom and things like this, and thou art in heaven and that sort of a thing. And um, we get the idea, or people today, because the King James Bible, first it was rejected by people, but later it was appreciated and it is considered a masterpiece of the English language. And um, it became the dominant translation of the Bible in English and still is the most common translation, but it can be very difficult to understand because the it was made in 1611. Now, because of this particular translation, because we're so familiar with it, and by the way, many of the verses that we have memorized over the centuries because we didn't start to use more modern translations until really the 1950s. In the 1950s, the Revised Standard Version became popular. Well, up till that, everybody was reading the King James Version. And so a lot of the things, you know, um, that we, a lot of the passages that we have memorized um, are coming from this King James Version, you know. So, uh, at any rate, the Our Father that we have memorized in English is from the King James Version of the Bible, and that's why it sounds kind of formal and a little stuffy. And the King James Version um, is feels that way to us because it refers, it uses words like thee and thou and giveth and taketh and cometh and goeth and things like this. Now, it's not really that the Bible is formal or stuffy, it's that the English at that time used to express itself in that way. The Greek of the Bible, and the Hebrew too, but here we're talking about Greek, um, is not formal. There is a kind of formality in modern Greek. You can address a person in a familiar way or a formal way when you meet someone, and likewise, you can do the same thing with, with Spanish. When you address somebody, you can address them in an informal way and in a formal way. Well, in the Greek of the Bible, it is informal. So I know that when it comes to our um, hymns of the church, there's a there are disagreements in choirs about whether we should sing thee or speak to God as you, to you, O Lord, or is it to thee, O Lord? Is it thee and thine? And we have the feeling like somehow we're being less respectful of God unless we use thee or thine. But the fact is, the Bible doesn't have that convention. Everything is on a very low basic level, and it's a level of familiarity. It is not stuffy, and it is not formal. So why don't we pause here before we start talking about the first words of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, and uh, let's take a break. And when we return, we will get into the prayer itself, okay? Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church, its phronima. 
Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the orthodox phronema is, how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true orthodox theology, as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox, now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, so the Lord's Prayer, as we mentioned, is in the Gospel of Matthew here in chapter 6, but it is also found in the Gospel of Luke, although it's a little bit shorter. And the Matthew version is a bit longer, and it's divided into two parts. There are what they, sometimes what they call you petitions, and those that are, that means thee or thou, those are the, that are addressed to God. And then the other three petitions or requests are, are um, we petition. So the first three are about God. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then the last three are the we petitions. They're about us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, lead us not into temptation. So the first half is directed to God, glorification of God. And the second half is really about us. So, um, that's Matthew's version. Luke's is a, a little bit shorter. Let's begin by looking at each of the phrase and actually each of the phrases and beginning with the words, our father, something that we are so familiar with, we hardly think about it. And as a matter of fact, many people refer to this prayer as the our father, not the Lord's prayer. And in Greek, we say, Paterimon. That's, that just means our father. Padre Nuestro, and you know, in Spanish, Padre Mon, our Father. But the fathers of the church have much to say about the fact that we even address God as Father. And have you noticed during the divine liturgy, before we say the prayer, the priest uh, calls us to recite the Lord's Prayer and, and asks that we be found worthy without judgment or condemnation, we, to, be, to dare to call, and to grant us to be worthy, to dare to call upon you, the heavenly God, as Father, and to say, right? So he reminds us of the fact that it is an amazing thing for us to call God Father. It's not a little thing, but because we're so comfortable with it, we're so familiar with it, we don't really realize what this alone is trying to teach us the fact that Jesus taught us to call God Father. So we're going to speak about that today. So um, because this was something that was very unusual about Christ. We know that Christ addressed God as Father. We know that he referred to God as his Father, but he did it in a very surprising way for the times. He called God Abba which is not the most formal way. We, in English, we say father. We call our male parent our father. This, I'd like you to introduce you to my father, so-and-so. But we don't usually call our dad father. When we address our father personally, we usually call them by some term of endearment, like daddy or dad or pop or papa or something, baba, whatever it is. Um, that's what Abba is. When the Lord addressed God, he addressed him in a familiar way and that in an affectionate way, the way a child would address his father. And this was very shocking to the Jews of his day. Now, as Christians, because we know this, of course, that's an Aramaic to call dad, uh, father Abba, um, because we know him as the Son of God, we're not very surprised by this. And because he taught us to refer to God as our Father, too, we're not very shocked by this. But um, what is surprising is that he not only did that himself, but encouraged us to also address God as our Father. Now, this informality is not really conveyed 
by the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, Our Father Who Art in Heaven. It wouldn't exactly sound right to say Our Daddy Who Art in Heaven, but it's closer to that than the kind of formal idea about God as Father. It's translated that way because, of course, the New Testament was written in Greek, and in Greek it's Pater, um, and not, um, uh, not something as familiar as Abba. So, um, but the the important thing here is not the informality of it, but the very idea that Christ was trying to convey to us that we should address God as our Father. And by the way, this is something that he has already done in Matthew's Gospel several times prior to giving us the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6. So listen to this, because we don't think about it. We're, you know, that's part of the difficulties um, when we're studying the Bible, is to, is to allow the text to strike us the way it would have the first readers. When we're so familiar with these passages, they cease impacting us. But I want you to take a listen to this. Uh, beware of practicing your piety before men in order to see by, be seen by them. Then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. That's chapter 6, verse 1. Okay? And then chapter 6, verse 4. Do your arm, Practice your alms in secret so your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You know? And then in uh, chapter 6, verse 6, when you pray, go to your room. And shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then in verse 8, this is all chapter 6, right before he introduces this prayer. Verse 8, do not be like the Gentiles, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then he introduces the prayer. So many, many times here, prior to the introduction of the prayer, several times there, at least four times, before he even teaches the disciples to address God as Father, he repeatedly refers to God as Father, and he will do so in other parts of the Gospel, later in the Gospel. So why does the Lord keep asking us to think about God as our Father? And was it any different for him when he prayed to God as his Father? So let's answer that second question first. Of course, it's different when Jesus called God Father than from when we call Father God Father, because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was the Son of God by nature, we say. That is, that is who he truly was by nature. He was equal to God the Father. On the other hand, we are sons and daughters of God by adoption. But by accepting Christ, we too can become children of God, um, not equal to God, to God and, and the Father and the Son, but by adoption. And this is what the prologue of St. John's Gospel says. To those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And this idea that we are truly children of God through Christ is something that is emphasized throughout the New Testament, not as kind of a nice poetic idea, but as a reality. And St. Paul also talks about addressing God as Father, Abba, which shows us that in the early church, when they were speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Aramaic, they were using that Abba form when they addressed God. They imitated Christ and did exactly what he said. So this teaching uh, by Jesus Christ, that God is our Father, and something that was continually emphasized by Him, and also um, by the in the early church, has tremendous implications, as because it suggests our heavenly destiny, and it suggests that we are not slaves of God, we are children of God, and that means we are heirs of the kingdom of God. In other words, we're, we are supposed to inherit the kingdom. Um, so that's very, very different than, than how other ancient people thought about their relationship to the gods. One of the things that people like to say, for example, 
is that the creation stories of Genesis are very similar to the creation stories of other ancient Near Eastern peoples. Well, I've already discussed that when I talked about Genesis in the original Search the Scriptures program. But uh, the truth is, it's not true at all. The creation story of Genesis is nothing like other ancient creation stories, because in the other ancient creation stories, the, the human beings were created to serve the gods, to be the slaves of the gods. And what God is telling us in the Old Testament and in the New, especially in the New Testament, is that we have been called to be his children. He is our father in the sense that he is our creator, that's for sure. But he is promising us um, a, a home with him, uh, an inheritance with him, the kingdom of heaven. And this is very different than saying, well, yes, you're going to come to the kingdom, but you're going to be my slaves. You're going to serve me. That's not what God promises. So as the children of God, we are not servants. We are not slaves. We are heirs of the kingdom. This means that it is something that is rightfully ours. And we, we can claim that status. And this is what the Lord speaks about many times. Now, is the Lord, this? is he the same? We said, we mentioned that when he referred to God as his father, we should note that when the Lord referred to his father, he did not um, put himself together in the same category as us. So when he would talk about his relationship to God, the father, he would say, my father. And then when he spoke to the disciples, he would say, your father. In other words, they had a different relationship with God than he had with God. So he would say, my father and I are one, or I've come to do the work of my father, or my father sent me. So he had a unique relationship to God as the only begotten son of God. We have a different relationship. We are called sons and daughters of God, but our relationship is obviously not the same as that of Christ because he was the son of God in a unique sense that we can never be. And yet by joining ourselves to Christ, we also become children of God by adoption. So uh, let's listen to St. Augustine in his sermon number seven, when he talks about calling God father. Okay. The son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us a prayer. And even though he is the Lord himself, as you have heard and repeated in the creed, the only son of God, yet he would not be alone. He is the only son, yet he would not be alone. He has accepted to have brothers. For to whom does he say, say, our father who art in heaven? Whom did he wish us to call our father except his own father? Did he begrudge us this? Parents sometimes, when they have one or two or three children, fear to give birth to any more, lest they reduce the rest to beggary. In other words, they don't want to dilute the inheritance. But because the inheritance which Christ promised to us is such as many may possess and no one be diminished, therefore he has called into his brotherhood the people of the nations. And the only son has numerous brethren who say our father who art in heaven. So said they who have come before us, and so shall those who will come after us. See how many brothers the only son has in his grace, sharing his inheritance with those for whom he suffered death. We had a father and a mother on earth that we might be born to labor and to death, but we have found other parents, God our father, and the church our mother, by whom we are born into eternal life. Let us then consider, beloved, whose children have begun to be, we have begun to be, and let us live so as to become those who have such a father. Do you see how our Creator has condescended to be our father? That St. Augustine, you know, St. Augustine, I know some people don't want to hear from St. Augustine because he made some theological mistakes, but his sermons can be very inspiring and, and really wonderful. Let's read another short excerpt from St. Augustine. This is from his sermon number eight. We have found then a father in heaven. Let us take good heed 
how we live on earth. For he who has found such a father ought to live that he may be worthy to come to his inheritance. But we all say in common, Our Father, how great a condescension! This the emperor says, and this the beggar says. This the slave says, and this his lord says. They all say together, Our Father, who art in heaven. Therefore they understand that they are brethren, seeing that they have one Father. And that's a very important point of calling God Father. One of the things you're going to see as we read through various fathers of the church and what they say about this is that there is this common theme. First of all, the great condescension and love of God who allows himself to be called Father by us. The fact that this elevates us to think about ourselves differently, but also that this is a great equalizer. And this is something here that St. Augustine has brought out. All of us address God as Father, no matter what our station, no matter what our gender, no matter our, spirit, no matter our spiritual state, whether somebody is a, is a pious saint or somebody is a terrible sinner. When we all say our Father, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's very important that nobody is above anyone else in, the, in this prayer. This is what it's showing. Here is St. John Chrysostom in his homily 19 on Matthew. See how straight away he stirred up the hearer and reminded him of all God's bounty in the beginning. For he who calls God Father, both remission of sins and taking away punishment and righteousness and sanctification and redemption and adoption and inheritance and brotherhood with the only begotten Son and the supply of the Spirit are all acknowledged by him in this one title. For no one can call God Father without having attained to all of these blessings. Doubly, therefore, does he awaken their spirit, both by the dignity of him who is called upon, that's the Father, and by the greatness of the benefits which they have enjoyed. He teaches, moreover, to make our prayer common in behalf of all of our brothers also, for he did not say, My Father who art in heaven, but our Father, offering up his supplications for the body in common, and nowhere looking to his own, but to every one's good. So that's a third benefit we see here uh, that Chrysostom brings out. It elevates our mind to think of ourselves differently, that if God is our Father, we have to live differently because God is our Father. Secondly, it makes us all equal. But third, Chrysostom is pointing out here by calling God our Father, then we're also praying for the common good of everyone, not just praying for ourselves. And by this at once, he takes away all hatred and quells pride and casts out envy and brings in the mother of all good things, love, and exterminates the inequality of human things and shows how far the equality reaches between the king and the poor man, at least in those things which are greatest and most indispensable, we are all brothers. For what harm comes of our kindred below, when in that which is on high all of us are knit together? No one has anything more than another, neither the rich more than the poor, nor the master more than the servant, neither the ruler than the subject, nor the king and the common soldier, the philosopher or the barbarian or the skillful and the unlearned. In other words, when we inherit the kingdom, it's the same for everybody. In other words, there's no one is better in a different situation than anyone else. To all he has given one nobility, having granted to be called the father of all alike. In the first place, even that saying alone is sufficient to implant instruction in all virtue. For he who has called God Father and a common Father would be justly bound to show forth such a conversation as to not appear unworthy of this nobility and to exhibit a diligence proportionate to the gift. Well, let's turn to someone else, not exactly a father, it's Origen. We haven't heard from Origen for 
quite a while, but because he's one of the earliest church writers, considered one of the greatest, the most brilliant minds of the church, who influenced so many fathers, they all read Origen. Uh, we're going to go ahead and read what Origen says about the Lord's Prayer from his treatise on prayer. And he st starts out by saying that he examined the Old Testament to see whether or not the Jewish people were encouraged to call God Father. And he notes that they were not. So this is something brand new. So if you think about, you know, we, we commonly say all, all of us are children of God. And we say that about all the people in the world, right? All of us human beings are children of God. That idea is a particularly Christian one. You know that? This idea of equality of all people is really a Christian thing. And you might say, well, that goes back to Genesis because that idea that we're all made by God and that kind, we have that kind of equality um, as the creatures of God is um, a Jewish thing because of Genesis. But the Jews didn't think of, their, um, of themselves that way and think of God as father in that way, even though in places in the Old Testament, it refers to God calling Israel, calling the people of Israel, um, for example, out of Egypt, out of Egypt, I have called my son, the, these things. So sometimes Israel was referred to um, as the son of God, the people of Israel as the children of God, but almost always in a negative sense. The fact when, when God was saying, I did this for you and this for you and this for you, and you disobeyed me or you worshiped other gods, we don't see that kind of loving um, relationship that is created or that, that they're, they're not certainly not encouraged to call God father. God, the image of God as parent is, is definitely present in the old Testament, but usually it's the parent who's been disappointed by the way we're child. And it's not that they were encouraged to refer to God as father or to really have that kind of intimate relationship with God that is being encouraged for us by Christ. So here is Origen from his treatise on prayer. It is right to examine what is said in the Old Testament quite carefully to see whether any prayer may be found in it calling God Father. Up until now, though I have looked as carefully as I can, I have found not one. I do not mean that God was not called Father or that those who are supposed to have believed in God were not called sons of God, but nowhere have I found a prayer. In a prayer, the boldness proclaimed by the Savior in calling God Father. But even if God is called Father and those who are begotten by the word of faith in him are called sons, the certainty and immutability of sonship cannot be seen in the Old Testament. Indeed, the passages I have listed indicate that those called sons are guilty. Okay, in other words, so as he examined all of this, remember Origen was, was famous as the greatest intellect of the church ever. And of course, he lived in the first half of the um, third century in the, he was active around the year, you know, 202 to about 254. And so he examines all the Old Testament and says he hasn't found a single prayer in which God is addressed as father. And even though sometimes the children of Israel were called the sons of God, they're usually in trouble for something. Okay. That's very, very different from what we have here. So he says, let us not suppose that the scriptures teach us to say our father at any appointed time of prayer. Rather, if we understand the earlier discussion of praying constantly, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Let our whole life be a constant prayer in which we say our father in heaven. And let us keep our commonwealth, not in any way on earth, but in every way in heaven, the throne of God, because the kingdom of God is established in all those who bear the image of the man from heaven, that's Christ, of course, and have thus become heavenly. Now let's take a look at what St. Cyril of Jerusalem said when he was instructing the newly baptized, do you know anyone who was baptized 
during a holy week or possibly the Saturday of Lazarus? I do. So many, many parishes had baptisms and people were baptized and, and, and received chrismation um, right at the beginning of Holy Week or during Holy Week on, on Holy Saturday. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem um, wrote and gave a number of sermons because what would happen on Bright Week is that the newly illumined would come to church uh, every day and they would receive instruction because uh, the creed was a secret and so was the Lord's Prayer. They were never allowed to stay for the divine liturgy until after they were baptized for the whole liturgy. They had to leave after the sermon, which was after the gospel reading. So they never heard the Lord's Prayer. And so during Bright Week, they would be instructed in the mysteries of the faith. And among those things were the Lord's Prayer. So uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived around 360 in the middle of the 4th century, he was the patriarch of Jerusalem. He delivered a num number of uh, of sermons about uh, the Lord's Prayer, about the Creed. And here's what he says about the Lord's Prayer and the fact that we address God as Father, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. We recite that prayer, which the Savior delivered to his own disciples, with a clear conscience designating God as our Father, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. Oh, the greatness of the mercy of God to those who had revolted from him, who had been reduced in the direst straits. He has granted so liberal a pardon for their crimes. He has been so prodigal of his favor that they might even call him Father. Something that that theme we see in a lot of of the fathers of the church let's return briefly to saint gregory of nisa whom we had begun with today in his treatise on the lord's prayer and see what he says about the fact that we call the lord father what does it mean that we call god our father here's saint gregory of nisa what spirit a man must have to say this word? What confidence, what purity of conscience? Suppose a man should try to understand God as far as is possible from the names that have been invented for him and so be led to the understanding of the ineffable glory. He would have learned that the divine nature, whatever it may be in itself, is absolute goodness, holiness, joy, power, glory, purity, eternity, that is always absolutely the same. These and whatever other things, thought, thoughts should learn about the divine nature, whether from the divine scriptures or from its own meditation, he would consider. And after all that, should he dare to utter such a word as to call the being Father? I'm going to pause at this moment because I see that we have a phone call. And the call is from Amelia. Hi, hello, Amelia. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Search the Scriptures Live. Where are you calling from, Amelia? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I am in Salt Lake City, Utah. Wonderful. Welcome to Search the Scriptures. Do you have a comment or question? Yeah, I do. I was listening to the last podcast that um, you've done on the Lord's Prayer, and it kind of got me thinking a lot about my personal situation. So I'm fairly new to Orthodoxy. I converted from Mormonism about two years ago. And um, my ex-husband and I were married about 12 years. We have four kids, and, you know, we got a divorce, and he's still very much Mormon, and so are my children. But mm -hmm. I really strongly desire to teach them, you know, how to pray correctly. Um, the more I learn about prayer, um, the more I realize that, you know, they're just, they're just, teaching them to speak heresy. It's mm -hmm. not real prayer in Mormonism. And so yes. um, as their mom, yes. I just want to be able to, you know, teach them properly. And I was wondering, you know, if, if you have like 
resources or <laughs> advice or um, just uh, pointing me in the right direction as yes. I try and sort of approach this in a delicate yes. way, but yes. a way that means something. Right. Do they live with you? Um, so they're 60% with him okay. and 40% with me. Yeah, but that's difficult. You know, and how old are they? Um, my oldest is 12 and my youngest is four. Okay. Well, the, the, the good thing is, of course, the bad thing is that they're separated from you uh, over half of the time. But the good thing is that they're still young and they're in this process of formation. And do you talk to them? Do they know that you're no longer a Mormon? Yes. And so that there's a lot of social pressure um, in uh, among Mormons to to remain Mormon. So are they feeling this kind of pressure? Um, of course, they, they're kind of young to have opinions about it. But did you face a lot of opposition when you decided to leave Mormonism? Yes, that's yeah. what made him divorce me. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So he's I really about on it edge. now, but yeah. No, that I could. No, that's what I would expect. And uh, so he's uh, he's uh, going to try to make sure that they do not become Mormons. He's going to do everything possible to protect as he yes. sees it his children. Right. So I think yes. there's a limit to what you can do. I think the best thing that we can do always, always, always for our children is to give them an example. I don't, I don't know that there's anything more that we could do in terms of resources. There may be people, there are, there are, um, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the priest. There are people who are doing a lot of work with Mormons who might be better equipped to give you some specific ideas, but they're already going to be um, watched by other members of the family and encouraged not to depart from the Mormon church the way you have. Um, so mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult, and I think what you need to do is be show a true Christian spirit and show in your behavior and your attitude and your life um, what it means to be a Christian. This And even if, don't despair and don't give up. Don't think that um, you're not necessarily going to see the fruits of your efforts, especially while they're young, but when they get older, they're, they're going to be asking questions themselves. They're not, they're not so much at this young age, but as they get older and they, if you, if when they were with you, you introduce them to orthodoxy, you bring them to church, you pray the prayers with them, even though they're not members of the church and you can talk to them about it in a very sort of low key way and explain things to them as best you can and just let it sit. These you're planting seeds in their brains that will grow fruit later. Do you understand? Um you're mm -hmm. not necessarily going to be able to immediately point to any one thing. You know, we you're in a very very difficult situation. Um but all of us as parents wonder whether or not we're doing a good job with our kids. You know, I remember thinking that about Chris. I, I hope he grows up and, and stays in the church and he is a, a good man and a pious man. All of us worry about our kids. Uh, I think it's harder for you, but the point is none of us knows. And all we can do is be good role models and do the best we can to introduce Christ to them in our home when they are with us. And um, they may get a lot of negative feedback from your ex-husband side of the family. But the important thing is that you persevere and that you continue and that you are always cheerful and kind and, and um, positive. And, and you can say that they don't understand. And, and then, you know, if your children ask you about Mormonism, as they get older, these are not questions that they're really necessarily going to have at this point in their young lives. But you're going to have a lot of opportunities to talk about faith with them. You will. And I would let, and just answer very matter-of-factly and let them think about these things. And in time, as, a, as adults, they'll make their own choices. So I think what you can yeah. do right now is simply to plant the seeds and have faith in God. And sometimes we don't even, I don't want to say don't live to see the fruits of our, of our prayer, but sometimes that happens, that we, we don't realize the the impact that we're having, especially with our kids, our kids don't ever want to give us the satisfaction of, 
of letting us see that we're having a positive impact on their life. They wa- I don't know if you remember this with your own parents. I remember with my mother just watching her a lot, how she interacted with people and the things that she did. I still remember those things. So mm-hmm. you just have to have faith that the Lord has led you to the church, persevere, do the best you can, and, and leave it to God. And it might take time for them. You're just going to have, you're playing a long game now, Amelia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a long game. You, it might look in the short term that nothing is, is making any impact, but you're not going to see that partly because they're with their dad and they don't want to lose their dad, right? They don't mm-hmm. want to lose that side of the family. They don't want to lose their father's approval. He's important to them also. So, um, uh, but you also never know what might happen with him. You just never know. So, uh, mm-hmm. I want to encourage you to to uh, not lose heart, to do the best you can, and uh, leave the rest to God. That's all you can do. Well, thank you very much. I wish I wish I had something specific to point you to. I'm trying to remember the name of the of the. There's a priest who's doing a lot of work with Mormons in Salt Lake City, and ortho, There's an Orthodox parish. So are you in Salt Lake? Yes. Okay, so there's an Orthodox parish. Father you, Anthony. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I remember okay. hearing. Uh, but you, the people who are working in, in Salt Lake City with Mormons, they're going to know better than I do because they have experience mm-hmm. with this. But I think in your unique situation, it's going to be a matter of you simply persevering in faith and with charity and with love and patience and always speaking you know, respectfully about their father, uh, not necessarily about the Mormon church, but about their father and uh, and and that this is going to have a profound because it's going to be such a strong contrast between what they experience in the ward on Sundays and what they see with you in church, right? It's going to be mm-hmm. very very strong contrast, and they can't help but ask questions and then be thinking about these things. But you're playing the long game, okay? So remember that that's what's the important thing, and that that the Holy Spirit will guide them, pray for them, and 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 ask others to pray for them, and I think that things will turn out okay. Thank you. All right, Amelia, God bless you. We're all praying for you, you now. Okay. Oh, thank you. Every, everybody <laughs> who's it. listening is praying for Amelia and her children. Okay. God bless you. Okay, so we are a little bit overdue for a break, so let's take a break, and when we come back, we will continue with the Fathers on the Lord's Prayer. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. This is Father Stephen Freeman. I'm happy to announce Ancient Faith's publication of my latest book, Face to Face, Knowing God Beyond Our Shame. Some modern therapists have described shame as the master emotion one that colors and shapes our world in ways that we hardly imagine. The Christian tradition is no stranger to this and has a rich understanding of the ways this part of our inner life shapes our experience of the world. This book offers something of a roadmap to that inner life. What is shame? Is it always bad? Does it have any useful purpose for us? Join me in an exploration of knowing God beyond our shame, finding the true God whom the scriptures tell us did not turn his face from the spitting and the shame. Face to Face is now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. All right, so let's continue a bit here with St. Gregory of Nyssa. What does it mean to call God Father when we say the prayer, Our Father? What does he say? That this means that we have to recognize who God is and not dare to call God Father unless he sees the same things in himself as he sees in God. He who is wholly pure cannot be the father of those who have disgraced themselves by unseemly passions, nor he who pours out benefits on him who is self-seeking. 
In short, he who is seen to be pure goodness cannot be father of those who are wholly involved in some evil. The unjust and impure cannot say father to the just and pure, since this would mean calling God father of his own wickedness, which would be nothing but pride and mockery. For the word father indicates the cause of what exists through him. Hence, if a man whose conscience accuses him of evil calls his God father, he asserts precisely that God is the cause and origin of his own wickedness. Well, what is is St. Gregory saying here that we shouldn't call God Father, we shouldn't pray the prayer, because all, all of us have sinned. Obviously, we're not wholly good, entirely good, and with, without sin. So is he saying that we shouldn't call that? He's What he's trying to say here is that by calling God Father, we have to change our way of life and behave as though God were our Father. Otherwise, by calling God Father, recognizing the sin in ourselves, we're saying that God is like us, because that's what it means to have a parent. You come from that. So we're attributing evil to God in a way. Of course, he's exaggerating. This is rhetoric. So as we continue, here's Gregory of Nyssa. If therefore the Lord teaches us in his prayer to call God Father, it seems to me that he is doing nothing else but to set the most sublime life before us as our law. If we call God our Father, who is incorruptible and just and good, we must prove by our life that the kinship is real. Do you see how much preparation we need? What kind of life we must lead? How ardent must be our zeal, so that our conscience may achieve such purity as to have the courage to say, Father to God? For if you make such prayer with your lips, while you are keen on money and occupied with the deceits of this world, while you are seeking fame among men or are enslaved by sensual passions, what do you think will he say to it who sees your life and knows what your prayer really is? So he is noticing the fact or noting for us the fact that we must change our lives if we're going to address God as Father in prayer. For this reason, before we approach God, we should first examine our life. If we have something worthy of the divine kinship in ourselves, so we may make bold to use such a word. For he who has commanded us to say Father has not permitted us to pronounce a lie. I like that. That's true. God, Jesus says, Jesus doesn't let us lie for us. So if he says we're supposed to call God Father, we're supposed to behave like the children of God. The divine is pure from envy and all stain of passion. Therefore, let no passion defile you. Neither let envy nor vanity or any of those things that would pollute the divine beauty. For such is what you are. You may boldly address God by a familiar name. And call the Lord of all your father. He will look upon you with the eyes of a father. He will clothe you with a divine robe and adorn you with a ring. He will shoe your feet with the upward journey with the sandals of the gospel and restore you to the heavenly fatherland. And of course, those last images are from the prodigal son parable, right? All right, let's see what St. Maximus the Confessor says about calling God our Father. He wrote a brief commentary on the prayer. Maximus the Confessor. Thus, by the way, what does confessor mean? Do you know what it means when we call a, a, a saint a confessor? It doesn't mean that he confessed his sins or that he uh, heard people's confessions. A confessor is someone who was tortured for Christ and yet survived. If he was tortured for Christ and died, he would be a martyr. But since he survived, he's called a confessor. That's what that means, just in case you don't know. So here's St. Maximus the Confessor. Thus, at the beginning of this prayer, we are directed to honor the consubstantial and superessential trinity as the creative cause of our coming into existence. Further, we are also taught to speak to ourselves of the grace of adoption, since we are worthy to call God Father by grace, 
the one who is our creator by nature. Thus, by respecting the designation of our begetter in grace, we are eager to set upon life the features of the one who gave us life. We sanctify his name on earth in taking after him as father, in showing ourselves by our actions to be his children, and in extolling by our thoughts and our acts the father's son by nature, who is the one who brings about this adoption. It is the son of God. It is Jesus Christ who causes this adoption, the one who is our brother, who's bringing us to the father. Um, so, uh, have you ever been with somebody and, you know, been introduced to their child and noticed that striking familial resemblance to them? I just had that experience over the weekend, met somebody who I've, one of my students, one of my Franciscan students, uh, I finally met his son. He's talked to me about his son for so long and I finally met the son and boy, he's the spitting image of his father. And, uh, I was so struck by that. And, of course, that's usually the case. Children usually look like their parents, but this is exactly what the fathers of the church are trying to draw, draw out for us by calling God Father. We are supposed to resemble our Father who is in heaven. So maybe in the future, when we start to pray our Father, which we do every day, you certainly do as part of your rule of prayer. I'm sure you must say the three Sahyon prayers, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Mortal. And then after that, you know, have, uh, you have all Holy Trinity, and then we say the, the prayer, Our Father. So whenever we say that, can we remember that we are supposed to behave as though God is our Father by being like Him? So let us take a look at the beautiful statements of St. Cyril of Alexandria, who discusses this in his commentary on St. Luke's gospel, which, as I mentioned, is a little bit different, not tremendously different, but a little bit different from the way the prayer appears in uh, Matthew's gospel. And let's see what he says about calling God our Father. St. Cyril of Alexandria. O boundless liberality, O incomparable gentleness that befits him alone, he bestows upon us his own glory. He raises slaves to the dignity of freedom. He crowns man's estate with such honor as surpassing the power of nature. He brings that to pass which was spoken of old by the voice of the psalmist. I said, you are gods and all children of the Most High. He rescues us from the measure of slavery, bestowing upon us by his grace that which by nature we did not possess. And he permits us to call God Father as being admitted to the rank of sons. From him we have received this, together with all our other privileges. And the wise John the Evangelist witnesses thereto, writing of him, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But to all who received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. For we have been fashioned into sonship by that birth, which is spiritually done in us, not by corruptible seed, but rather by the living and abiding word of God. In a certain place, he cl clearly explained the manner of this birth by declaring, I say to you, unless a man is born by water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So how do we become children of God? Through baptism. This is something that is through the church, which is made possible to us through Jesus Christ. Right? So notice how here how Cyril ties this to the statement to Nicodemus. Unless you are born by water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is how we are reborn. This is how we become children of God, born not of the a will of man or of the flesh or of blood, but by God. We are born of God through baptism. For you it is right to speak even of those things that are mysterious. He himself became both the way and the door, the cause of grace being bestowed upon us, thus glorious and worthy of our gaining. 
by having taken upon himself our likeness. For although he perceived to be and is God, he is free. Yet he took the form of a slave. Of course, he's speaking here of the incarnation of the Son of God. When Jesus, when the Son became incarnate, the Logos was incarnate. He was free, yet he became a slave. That he might bestow upon us these things which are his, and enrich the slave with his own excellencies. For he alone by nature is free, because he alone is the Son of the Father, even of him who is supreme above all and rules over all, and who is by nature truly free. But inasmuch as in the dispensation, that's the economy, that's the, that's the incarnation, basically, through the incarnation, he transferred to himself what is ours, that is, he became a human being, the son became a human being. He has given us what, what is his. So look at how here Cyril of Jerusalem and other fathers of the church actually also do this. They connect the words, our father, to the incarnation. Christ became one of us, became a human being. And by doing so, he also made it possible for us to become holy like he is, to share his life, to make God truly our father um, in, in a, a real sense, not, of course, in the um, essential sense through sharing the essence of who God is, but in a real sense to become children of God the Father, to share his own sonship with us. He has given us what is his. For our things by which is meant the condition of human nature is poverty to God the Word, while it is wealth to human nature to receive what things are His. And of these one is called the dignity of freedom, a gift particularly befitting those who have been called to sonship. And this I mentioned is also His gift, for He said to us, Call no man your father on earth, one is your father who is in heaven." And you are all brothers. We're going to come to that passage. That's also in the Gospel of Matthew. For because he became like us, we have thereby gained brotherhood with him. He commands us, therefore, to take boldness and to say in our prayer, Our Father, we children of earth and slaves, subject by the law of nature to him who created us, call the one who is in heaven father and most fittingly he makes those who pray understand this also that if we call god father and have been counted worthy of such a distinguished honor must we not necessarily lead holy and thoroughly blameless lives and behave in a way that is pleasing to our father and neither think nor say anything unworthy or unfit for the freedom that has been bestowed upon us. For it is a most serious thing to grieve and provoke a father by turning aside to those things which are not right. How do earthly fathers act or what is their feeling toward their sons when they see them willing and to conform themselves to their wishes or choosing that course of conduct which is pleasing them. They love and honor them. They open to them their house. They multiply their presence. But if they are disobedient sons and intractable and have no respect for the laws of nature and are indifferent to that affection of the Father, which is implanted in us, the fathers drive them away from their houses and deem them unworthy of any honor or indulgence. They even refuse to acknowledge them as sons and do not write them as their heirs. Arise now, I pray, from things as they are with us to those things that transcend us. Though you call God Father, honor him with ready obedience. Yield submission to that which is his due. Live so as to he pleases. Do not show yourself harsh or proud, but on the contrary, tractable and submissive and ready without delay to follow his directions so that he may honor you in return and appoint you a fellow heir with him 
who is the Son by nature. For if he gave him for us, in other words, if the Father gave the Son for us, which is what he did, how will he not with him also give us all things, according to the expression of the blessed Paul? But if you have no regard for yourself, and you do not heed the bounteous gift that is bestowed, you are proven to be bold and, so to speak, without salt. You love pleasure more than you love the Father. Fear, therefore, lest God also say to you that which was spoken to the Israelites by the word of Isaiah, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have begotten and brought up children, but they have rejected me. You see, you see that passage there when we spoke earlier about the fact that Origen and others have noted that in the Old Testament, when the Lord speaks about Israel or the children of Israel as his sons, very often it's because they have strayed away from God. But nowhere, Origen mentions, nowhere do we ever see an instruction in the Old Testament or any prayer in which God is addressed as Father. All of this, of course, changes with the coming of Jesus Christ, with the incarnation of the Son of God, who gives us by his example and teaches us what it means to be God. He gives us by his physical presence on earth and by his actions every day, by his teachings, and by his example, how we are supposed to behave as sons and daughters of God. So let's finish up here with St. Cyril of Alexandria. Heavy in every way, my beloved, is the guilt of those who rebel, and most wicked is the crime of rejecting God. Very wisely, therefore, as I said, does the Savior of all grant us to call God Father, that we, well knowing that we are sons and daughters of God, may behave in a manner worthy of him who has thus honored us. For so he will receive the supplications which we offer in Christ, by whom and with whom, to God the Father, be praise and dominion with the Holy Spirit unto the ages of ages. And so Cyril of Alexandria ends that particular sermon on the term or on the phrase, our father. And we've come to the end of our program. So I don't know about you, but I hope that I remember this and I no longer just say the words, our father, without really thinking about what that means, that we are called to live differently, that, that, that God has graced us and honored us with the privilege of addressing him as father. And because of this, we have to prove worthy of that. Okay. So I hope you join us next week as we will talk about what it means and why the Lord said we should address our father who art in heaven. What about that? What's behind what, what's behind that phrase? What meaning can we draw out of that phrase? So I'll also ask you to remember to pray for Amelia and for her children and not to forget to pray for them. And so many other people who we say that we will pray for, and sometimes we forget. So let's pray for them right away and remember them in our prayers and all those who are, who are in need of prayer. And when we, whenever we say the Lord's Prayer, that we will remember what it means to call God Father. So join me next week as we will continue our study of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. And now let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people. Israel. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Alithos anestio Truly the Lord is risen. Good night.